Expecting Someone Taller by Tom Holt Chapter 15 For about a week after the going down of the old gods, Malcolm was kept rather busy. Minor spirits and divine functionaries called at all hours of the day and night, with papers for him to read and documents to sign, most of which were concerned with trivial matters. The remaining gods had been stripped of the last few vestiges of authority by the destruction of wartime, and try as they might, they could not persuade the ring-bearer to transfer any of his duties or powers to them. In the end, the majority of them accepted the new order of things, and the few recalcitrant deities who continued to protest found themselves posted to remote and uninhabited regions where their ineffectual energies could be expended without causing any real disturbance. In an effort to appear positive, Malcolm recreated a new class of tutelary deities. The rivers and oceans had long had their own guardian spirits, originally installed when shipping was the main form of transport in the world. In the last few centuries, however, this role had diminished, whereas the roads and railways had gone without any form of heavenly representation. Malcolm therefore assigned most of the redundant spirits to the railway networks and motorways, a system which seemed to satisfy most requirements. He commissioned the Norns to set up a system of appointments. All gods wishing to be assigned a road or railway had to take a written exam and were posted according to the results they obtained. Since their duties were strictly honorary, it made little difference to the world at large, but it seemed to please the divine community. It gave them a purpose in life, and when one is dealing with immortals, that is no mean achievement. There were also vacancies in existing posts to be filled, for many river spirits and cloud shepherds had perished along with their master in the attack on Coombe Hall. Again, the Norns were given the task of drawing up a list of unfilled posts with a parallel list of suitable candidates. Malcolm, who was unfamiliar with divine prosopography, had to rely heavily on the judgment of his advisers, but for some reason virtually all the supernatural beings he met were patently terrified of him, and this terror, combined with his ability to read thoughts, made corruption or favouritism seem unlikely. He found the terror he inspired in his subordinates extremely hard to understand. Admittedly, his patience was sorely tested at times, for all the gods and spirits took themselves extremely seriously, even though their power was non-existent, and he had to admit that he did sometimes lose his temper with them, causing the occasional shower of unplanned rain. But the world continued to thrive and prosper, with only the epidemic of love and romance spoiling an otherwise perfect situation. One thing did worry him, however. The Tarnhelm seemed to have developed a slight fault. Occasionally, after a particularly trying meeting or a long night of paperwork, he found to his disgust that he had changed his shape without wanting to, and for some reason the shape that the Tarnhelm selected for him was invariably that of water. This, and a curious craving for schnapps, gave Malcolm pause for thought, but he dismissed his fears as paranoia, and carried on with the work of reorganisation. But he was not happy. Although he could not remember what she had looked like, he knew that Ortlind was very much on his mind, and he could not help feeling horribly guilty about having caused her to cease to exist. He closed up the library at Clutham Hall, but the house itself seemed to be haunted by her, and eventually he decided that the time had come to leave for good. He sent for Colonel Booth, whose real name he discovered was Guttorm, thanked him for the loan of his house, and started to look for a new place to live. Somehow he felt no enthusiasm for the task, and although the Norns, whom he found invaluable, continually sent him details of highly attractive properties all over the world, he found it difficult to summon up the energy to go and view them. Then one day the younger Norn remarked that there was always Valhalla itself. But I thought it had been burnt down, Malcolm said. Burnt, yes, said the Norn. Down, no. The shell is still intact. I've had the architects out there, and they say it could easily be made habitable again. Of course, the best builders in the world were the giants, and they're all dead now, but they were always expensive and difficult to work with. That, Malcolm felt, was something of an understatement. Nevertheless, the idea seemed curiously attractive, and he went out with the younger Norn to look at the place. You could have tennis courts here, and maybe a swimming pool, said the Norn, pointing with her umbrella to what he had once been the crack of doom. Or, if you don't like the idea of that, how about a rock garden, or an ornamental lake, with real gnomes, she said dreamily. 
I think I'd rather just have a lawn, Malcolm replied, and some rose beds. The Norn shrugged, and they moved on to inspect the steps of a Noen. How about a maze? suggested the Norn. Appropriate, really. No, said Malcolm. I think a garage might be rather more use. Please yourself. Anyway, you like the place? Well, it's quiet, and the neighbours aren't too bad. I live most of my life in Derby, Malcolm said. It's certainly different from there, but it's rather a long way from the shops. I wouldn't have thought that would have worried you, having the Tarnhelm and so on. True, said Malcolm, but sometimes I like to walk or drive, just for a change. No problem, said the Norn. We'll build you a replica of your favourite city. Valhalla New Town, we could call it. The thought of a heavenly version of Milton Keynes was almost enough to put Malcolm off the whole idea, but he asked the Norn to get some plans drawn up and hire an architect. The work would be done by the Nibelungs, who would do a perfectly good job without making unreasonable demands, as the giants had done. On the way back, they passed the charred stump of a tree, which had once been the world ash. To their amazement, they saw a couple of green shoots emerging from the dead and blackened wood. That tree's been dead ever since Wotan first came on the scene, said the Norn. It represents life force, apparently. Get someone to put one of those little wire cages round it, said Malcolm. We don't want the squirrels getting at it. Malcolm returned from his trip to Valhalla feeling rather tired. Not by the journey, but by the company of the younger Norn. He sat down in the drawing room and took his shoes off. He wanted a quick glass of schnapps and ten minutes with the paper before going to bed. He was getting middle-aged, he realised, but such considerations did not really worry him. Youth, he had decided, was not such a big deal after all. He looked out over the trout stream and suddenly found himself in tears. For a moment he could not understand why, but then he realised what had caused what was, generally speaking, an unusual display of emotion. The trout stream had reminded him of Flosshild, whom he had missed even more than the shoe-inspecting Valkyrie. He had treated Flosshild very badly. No, it wasn't guilt that was making him cry. He had shut it out of his mind for so long that he imagined that it had gone away, but now he knew what his real problem was. He had heard a story about a man who had gone through life thinking that the word lunch meant the sun, and it occurred to him he had been in roughly the same situation himself. Until very recently, he had not known what the word love really meant. He had thought it referred to the self-deceptive and futile emotion that had plagued him since he first had enough hair on his chin to justify buying a razor of his own. On the night of the confrontation with Wartan, he had suddenly realised his mistake. He had loved Flosshild then, just at the very moment when she had ceased to exist. So horrible had that thought been that he had excluded it from his brain, but now it had come back and taken him by surprise, and he could see no way of ever getting rid of it. The sorrow he had felt for Ortlund was little more than sympathy, but he needed the Rhine daughter. The thought of going to live in Valhalla, or being the ruler of the universe without having her there, was unbearable. The thought of being alive without having her there was bad enough. He shook his head and poured out some more schnapps. Many momentous and terrible things had happened, and the gods had all gone down, just to teach Malcolm Fisher the meaning of the word love. Had he paid more attention to his English teacher at school, he reflected, the whole world might have been saved a great deal of trouble. He picked up the local paper and saw a photograph of a tall girl and a man with large ears standing outside a church. Les Ayres had married Philip Wilcox. He smiled, for this fact meant nothing to him at all. The sooner he got out of this house, the better. Someone had left the French windows open. He got up and closed them, for the night was cold. Summer had passed, and it would be unethical of him to extend it for his own convenience. It had been a strange season, he reflected, and it was just as well that it was over now. The world could cool down once again, and he could allow it to rain with a clear conscience. Why am I doing all of this? he said aloud. Now at last he understood. It was blindingly obvious, but because he was so stupid he hadn't seen it before. The world, now God-free and generally purified, was no longer his to hold on to. He must give the ring to his sister Bridget. She, after all, was older than him, and much cleverer, and generally better equipped to handle difficult problems. He was only the intermediary. 
Everything fell into place and he felt as if a great burden had fallen from his shoulders. If only he had done it before. Flosshild would not have gone down, and he might even have had a happy ending of his own. But he had been foolish and willful, just as his mother would have expected. He had suffered his punishment, and now there was no time to lose. As he had said himself, Bridget was the member of the Fisher family who most resembled the glorious Siegfried. It explained why Ingolf had been so surprised when he had heard his name. He had been expecting Bridget Fisher on that fateful night. He looked at his watch, trying to calculate what time it would be in Sydney. Hadn't Mother Earth herself said something about the ring rightfully being Bridget's property, because she was the eldest? It would, of course, be difficult to explain it all, for his word carried little credibility with his immediate family. If he said something, they naturally assumed the reverse to be true. But Bridget was wise and would immediately understand, even if his mother didn't. With luck, they would let him keep the Tarnhelm, but if Bridget needed it, of course she must have it. He swallowed the rest of his drink and called for an overcoat. He looked quickly in the mirror to make sure that his hair was neat and tidy. His mother was most particular about such things, and saw to his astonishment that he didn't look like Malcolm Fisher at all. Then he remembered that he was still wearing a Tarnhelm. He'd need that to get to Australia, but he might as well stop pretending to be somebody he wasn't. Right, he commanded. Back to normal. The image in the mirror didn't change. It was still the Siegfried face he'd been wearing for so long. Back to Malcolm Fisher, he said irritably. Come on, jump to it. No change. Angrily, he felt for the little buckle under his chin, which he hadn't even noticed for so long now. It came away easily, and he pulled the chainmail cap off and tossed it onto the sofa. No change. The face that stared stupidly at him out of the mirror was the face of Fafner's bane, Siegfried the Volksung. He groaned and knelt down on the floor. Once again, his mother had been proved right. He had stuck like it. From now until the day he died, he was going to have to go around with the evidence of his deceit literally written all over his face. Worse, he could not even remember what he really looked like. If he knew that, he might be able to get some sort of clever mask made. But the picture had completely vanished from his mind. He picked up the Tarnhelm and gazed at it hopelessly, feeling as he had done when, as a child, he had broken a window and scratched the paint. He had done something awful which could not be put right, and it was all his fault. The next morning was bright and cold, and Malcolm woke early with a headache, which he prosaically blamed on the schnapps. To clear his head, he strolled down by the trout stream and stood for a while kicking stones into the water. "'Do you mind?' said a girl's voice. He knew that voice. He tried hard not to recognise it, because a girl it had belonged to had gone up in a cloud of theology, along with the rest of the high gods. He had sent his two ravens out looking for the owner of that voice, and they had searched the earth for many days without finding her. She no longer existed except in the memories of a few unusual people. So what was she doing in this trout stream? Is that you? he said stupidly. Of course it's me, said the voice irritably. Who do you think it was? The Bismarck? He scrambled down the bank, slipped and fell in the water. As he did so, it occurred to him that he couldn't swim, and that he had forgotten that the trout stream was only two feet deep. In his panic, he also forgot about the Tarnhelm, and had already resigned himself to the prospect of death by drowning when Flosshild fished him out. "'Sorry,' she said. "'Did I startle you?' That was one hell of a leading question, and rather than try and phrase an answer that might not be held against him in future, he replied by throwing his arms around her and kissing her, clumsily but effectively. It had not entered his mind that she might object to this, and luckily she seemed to like it. "'Where the hell have you been?' he said at last. Flosshild grinned. "'Did you miss me?' she asked superfluously. "'I thought you'd been sapped,' he said. "'Oh, so you've missed me.' Of course I've bloody missed you. Where have you been? On holiday. On holiday? Yes, said Flosshild, and she could not understand why Malcolm found this so strange. We'd planned to go to the Nile Delta again this year, but then that Ortland business blew up and by the time it was all over, everywhere was full, so we went and stayed with our cousins on the seabed. It was rather boring, actually. They're terribly stuffy people, and they've got a pipeline running right through the middle of their sitting room. So that's why I thought a memory couldn't find you. Were they looking? They've been doing little else since you vanished. You might have let me know. Flossild grinned again. I didn't know you cared. 
Honestly, I didn't. I only came back to look for a comb I'd left behind. Now, that was not strictly true, except for the bit about the corn, but she hoped he wouldn't notice. It had been no fun at all on the seabed, and she hadn't been able to get him out of her mind. His reaction to her last remark was therefore likely to be rather important. Well, I do care. I care a whole lot. Yes, said Flosshild, remembering the scramble down the bank and the kiss. I think you probably do. Snap, by the way, <laughs> you're all wet. Am I? Yes, perhaps it'd be a good idea if we got out of the water. Malcolm could see no reason for this, for he was happier standing in two feet of water with the girl he loved and needed more than he'd ever been on dry land. But if she thought it'd be a good idea, he was willing to give it a try. They climbed out and sat down under a tree. It so happened that it was the same tree that Ortland had been standing under when he first kissed her, but he couldn't be expected to remember everything. Let's not talk about it, Flosshild said. You know what that leads to. Let's have a nice time for the rest of our lives. Put like that, it seemed perfectly simple. Malcolm leaned back against the oak tree and thought about it for a moment. Whatever he felt like doing was probably right. He had that on the very best authority. Fair enough, he said. But first I must give the ring to my sister Bridget. Don't be silly, but I've got to. You see, don't be silly. All right then, Malcolm said. I'll give it to you. He took off the ring, looked at it for a moment, tossed it up in the air, caught it again, and slipped it onto the fourth finger of her left hand. Then he waited for a second. Nothing happened. Flossild stared at him with her mouth wide open. It suits you, he said. What did you do that for? First, said Malcolm, because it was originally yours. Second, because you're much older and cleverer than I am. Third, because I love you. Fourth, because it's worth it just to see the look on your face. Flosshild could think of nothing to say, and Malcolm savoured the moment. It was probably the last moment of silence he could expect from her for many, many years. Are you sure? said Flosshild. Malcolm started to laugh, for it had been Ortlin's favourite phrase, and soon Flosshild was giggling too. No, but honestly, she said, it's the ring. Be serious for a moment. Serious? Malcolm grabbed her arm and pulled her close. Don't you see? That's the last thing in the world I can afford to be. Ever since you went away, something terrible has been happening to me. I couldn't think what it was, even though everyone was trying to tell me. Even the Tarnhelm. I was turning into Wotan. I was starting to become just like him. Never, said Flosshild. You couldn't be. For a start, he was taller than you. I could, and I nearly did. When I realised it, my first reaction was to give the ring to my sister Bridget, because everyone always said she was so much more responsible than me. But you were right. That would have been the worst possible thing I could have done. Then you came back and I suddenly understood. The only person in the world that that thing is safe with is you. Me? But that's impossible. I'm not a nice person at all. Not you as well. No, I mean it. I'm probably not cruel or malicious, but I'm thoughtless and frivolous. I wouldn't take the job seriously, and the world would get into an awful mess. I'd forget to make it rain at the right time, because I'd always wanted to be fine for sunbathing, and if I was bored with it being January, I'd make it July again, and then everything would get out of gear. I'd be hopeless at it, really. That's what I thought when I started, and it hasn't turned out too badly, has it? Flossild frowned and bit her lip, a manoeuvre she had often practised in front of the mirror. Oh, go on then, she said. Just to please you, I will. That, said Malcolm triumphantly, is the best possible reason. You've passed. Congratulations. I still think, said Flosshild, holding up the ring to the light to admire it, that you're being a bit hasty. She tailed off. You're right, she said. It does suit me. It'll go very nicely with that gold evening dress I got in Strasbourg. She took one more look at the ring and promptly dismissed it from her mind, for she had more important things to think about. Why the sudden change of heart? she asked. I mean, when I left for the seabed, you were still madly in love with that stuffy old Valkyrie with the interesting shoes. You aren't going to change your mind about me, are you? I hope not, said Malcolm. We'll have to see, won't we? Did I ever tell you the story? Later. It's a very funny story. Did I ever tell you the story of the idiot who ran over a badger? I know that one. But I tell it very well. It's the only really funny story I know. Go on then. He told her the story and she laughed, although she knew that she could have told it rather better herself. In fact, she could have done his voice rather better than he could. 
but it didn't matter. This was happiness, she realised, even more than sunbathing or the parties they used to have at Camelot. She was slightly disappointed with herself for being made happy so easily, for she'd always thought of herself as a rather glamorous, sophisticated person. Nevertheless, it would do very nicely to be going on with. Malcolm listened to her laughter, and for the first time in his life he knew that everything was going to be all right. Niceness, he realised, was not enough, and love was only part of the rest. You had to have laughter too. Laughter would make everything come out right in the end. Or if it didn't, nobody would know it is. He started to tell about his plans for the new Valhalla. She liked the idea, and started making suggestions about how the place could be redecorated. These mostly seemed to consist of swimming pools, flumes and ornamental lakes, and he realised that sooner or later he was going to have to learn how to swim. The thought made him shudder, but he put it on one side. By the way, he said, I suppose you're immortal. I think so. Why? Isn't that going to make it rather difficult for me? You see, I'm not. Flossil shook her head. I solved that one some time ago, she said. Did you know? That was thoughtful of you. Flossil blushed spontaneously for once and realised that she hadn't quite timed it right, which was unusual for her, seeing as she was unquestionably one of the three best blushers in the world. But Malcolm didn't seem to have noticed, and it was nice to be with somebody who didn't criticise you when you got something wrong. I looked it up in all the books, she went on, and there's no problem. Every time you feel yourself getting old, you just turn yourself into someone younger. Malcolm shook his head. I don't think the Tarnhelm works anymore, he said sadly, and he told her about his attempt to go back to being Malcolm Fisher. She laughed and told him not to be silly. Haven't you learned anything, she said. You tried to turn yourself into Malcolm Fisher. You are Malcolm Fisher. Of course it didn't work. Malcolm didn't quite follow that, but he was reassured. There didn't seem to be anything else to worry about now, so he suggested that they went in and had some breakfast instead. Just a moment, said Flosshild. She looked hard at the ring, held her breath and pointed at the sky. A small pink cloud appeared out of nowhere, rushing across the sky until it was directly overhead. There was a blinding flash of pink lightning and the cloud had vanished. The air was filled with pink rose petals, and a flight of flamingos climbed gracefully into the air. No, said Flosshild, maybe not. Seemed like a good idea at the time. It's the thought that counts, Malcolm said. Come on, I'm hungry. They walked into the house, and the two ravens who had been eavesdropping from the branches of the oak tree looked at each other. I think that's nice, said Memory. Idiot, said Thought. Is that a dead rabbit? I can see over there. Where? just by that patch of nettles. Now you're talking, wow, said Memory. They glided down and started to peck. It was a good meaty rabbit, and they were both hungry. When he had finished, Memory wiped his beak neatly on his leg and stood thoughtfully for a while. Did you ever see that film? he said. What film? Can't remember. Anyway, it reminds me a bit of that happy ending and all. Thought shook his head. Don't like happy endings, he said. They're a cop-out. Life's not like that. I don't know, said Memory. Sometimes it is. You're soft, you are, said Thor scornfully. Come on, time we were on our way. They sailed up into the sky and began their day's patrol. Wherever life was stirring, beams were working, they flew, their bright round eyes missing nothing, their ears constantly alert. But today was going to be another quiet day in the best of all possible worlds. After a while... They grew bored and turned back. As they flew over the little village of Raleigh's Cross, they saw three workmen with pickaxes trying to break up a strange outcrop of rock which had appeared in the middle of the road some months earlier. But their tools would not bite on the hard stone, and they'd given it up for a while. Well, all you want to know is, said one of the men, how did it get here in the first place? Memory dived down and perched on the rock which had once been the giant Ingolf. It's a long story, he said, but the man wasn't listening.